Interspersed amongst all my crushes, obsessions, and trysts are the three and a half times I've fallen in love. <laughs> the half a time is with Julia, the daughter of my parents' longtime friends with whom we spent a couple of weekends each year. Julia and I had always gravitated towards each other, making sure that we sat together during meals or sneaking off for long walks through the woods bordering their upstate house. During one of those walks this summer we both turned 15, our gait slowed and stopped, as if we were mesmerized by the gathering dusk. I had never considered how it would happen, but it did. I put my hand on her back, gently turned her my way, our lips met, our tongues touched, and we floated into the darkening, enveloping sky, my first kiss. It was a sensation that when blended with the anticipa anticipation of our next encounter, had to be love. During the second semester of my junior year at college, I met May, a senior majoring in psychology and Russian lit. Our two years together were beset by all sorts of complications, among them her going to graduate school two hours away and her University of Texas boyfriend. But the greatest complication was that I loved her more when we were apart. <laughs> it was love, no doubt, because the histrionics that often led one of us to storm out in a fury quickly faded from memory to be replaced by the vision of the relieved embrace and warm kisses when we reunited. Early in March, after I'd graduated, May and I took a break following another maelstrom. In the thrall of a beer and Jack Daniels fueled episode, Nina and I hooked up. She stayed over that night and the following night and once or twice a week after that. Those were wondrous indulgent times, but the experience of looking forward to seeing Nina wet by a day's random events, a glint of sunlight and overheard comment, along with our three-hour phone calls and the nights we were apart, was surpassed by our time together, by our meandering conversations, by her caustic insights, and her ability to skewer and seduce me simultaneously. <laughs> a year after we met, Nina and I moved in. And 18 months later, we got married, and 15 years and three children after that, I fell in love for the third time. <laughs> Trisha was hired as an assistant office manager at the publishing company where I edited business newsletters. She was filling out some forms in the reception area when I returned after a meeting and saw her for the first time. My thoughts became jumbled. But the next day I introduced myself, and after that we spoke frequently and easily, sometimes for five minutes, ten minutes, a half hour. Trisha was born in Columbia, moved to New York when she was nine. She was adventurous, loved skydiving and bungee dump jumping, skateboarded all around the city. She was an actress who had appeared in several indie films and TV commercials. When I told her about my stash of poetry, she asked if I had ever submitted my stuff. I hadn't. You've got to share your stuff, Trisha insisted. Go to poetry readings. Let other people hear you. Sometimes, but not often, I gripe to her about married life. Being married is such a challenge, she once replied empathetically. Another time, she cut me off, locked her eyes on mine. Next time you get that feeling that you two are remote, Look at her and remember those times when you fell in love. You'll see she's the same person and all that energy will come back. About after several weeks, I began dreading Fridays, the last I'd see of Trisha for three days. But the wasteland of Sunday nights was transformed into a carnival of expectations because the next day she and I would fill each other in on our weekend's adventures. But lurking in my overheated imagination was a foreboding that one day I would show up to work and she would be gone. And indeed, one morning, about six months after she started working for us, I arrived at the office to learn that Trisha had quit the last day without notice or explanation. I tried to focus on the approaching deadlines, but couldn't avoid the recurring jolt of dread and despair. I felt as if I were traveling through a corridor where my remaining days, joyless and indistinguishable, were laid out in front of me. It was a feeling I'd never before experienced, but realized was a variant of love, a furious, bittersweet, profound love, born in the fusion of connection and limits, disappointment and acceptance. What's wrong, Nina asked when I got home at night. I've just been thinking about the end of time. But in all honesty, Trisha didn't cause any strain at home. At least I don't think she did. Any long-term relationship has its trying times, but I never considered seriously striking out on my own, never half-joked to Trisha that we run off together even when Nina and I weren't in sync, when our conversations consisted only of sharp questions and curt responses. A few weeks after Trisha's departure, Nina and I were riding out one of those stretches. Nina was sitting at the opposite end of the sofa reading when I decided to give Trisha's suggestion a try. I focused my gaze on Nina and called to mind our wild and romantic times together, and almost instantly I felt that joyful rush of falling in love, but along with it came 
waves of love, from the day we got married, from when our children were born, from the times we got away by ourselves for a night, now we were sure of each other. There are waves of varying amplitudes and frequencies, waves that carried us aloft and waves that passed through us, always leaving something behind, a sense of joy, fulfillment, completeness, a sense that could be rekindled with a little effort. And before I could make sense of any of this, Nina slid over, her eyes still fixed on the page, and rested her head against my shoulder. Mm. 